Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let's try that one more time. I know our ballots are full. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, I don't have everyone yet. This is the teacher in me now. We're going to bring it back and transition from lunchtime back to the second half of our afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Much better. I know that we are still enjoying dessert, the tea, the coffee, and the like, so we still encourage and welcome you to still partake in the dessert bar as well as the beverages, but we are going to continue on with our afternoon. For those of you who have just joined us, we'd like to welcome you for joining us for the second afternoon part of Bermuda Leeds Entrepreneurial Leadership Summit. This is the inaugural one, um, welcomed also by Benedict Associates. We had an awesome morning of presenters presenting on the topic of entrepreneurial leadership, and we are going to pick back up now with our afternoon presentations. Our next presenter Jason D. General Sukdeo. Anybody know what is associated with that name? BHW. I'm not going to tell you what I be doing in June, however. <laughs> Jason is a proud Bermudian with Guyanese heritage. Island life is in his blood, and at a young age, he fell in love with soca music. <laughs> This love turned into passion, and later, once he returned to Bermuda from university in Canada, his DJ alter ego, D General, was born. He gained a steady following, and D General became known as the island's top soca DJ. Today, hundreds tune into his weekly show on Vibe 103, and thousands dance behind the passion truck as he plays during the 24th of May Heritage Days parade. Can I do a surveillance? Anybody follow the truck in here? Okay, all right, I see some hands low and some hands high. <laughs> Jason combined his love of circle with his love of people and carnival and created Bermuda Heroes Weekend. This Bermudian entrepreneur has grown the BHW into a series of events that are dedicated to providing unique cultural experiences and quality entertainment. The BHW Limited team are not only avid carnival goers, but collectively have over 15 years of producing successful events and have gained the respect of some of the top celebrities in the world of soca music. The BHW Limited are pioneering new ground and there are no limits with Jason D. General Sugdeo leading the team. Ladies and gentlemen, our first presenter for the afternoon, Mr. Jason D. General Sugdeo. Good afternoon, everybody. Okay, we'll be back. Um, thank you, Nashanti, for that introduction. Um, anytime I'm walking on stage, from now on, you're booked. Uh, <laughs> that was exciting. <laughs> um, good afternoon to our premier in his absence. Uh, the Bermuda Leeds team, uh, the Bermuda Leeds event sponsors, invited guests, patrons. And I want to say a special good afternoon to the students in the back. Um, when I walked in, I was excited and happy to see uh, young people who are interested in entrepreneurship from Barclay and Cedar Bridge at the other table. And then there's somebody responsible for getting them here. So good afternoon to you and thank you for getting our young people involved. Uh, my name is Jason Sukdeo and I'm the CEO of BHW Limited and the founder of Bermuda Heroes Weekend. Sure this is working. After the recent U.S. Uh, presidential election in 2016, Hillary Clinton's pastor emailed her the following words after everything was complete. God doesn't close one door without opening another, but it can be hell in the hallway. Today, I'm here to talk about my personal experience in the hallway and how I became an entrepreneur and why I'll never go back. Uh, I started out right here in Bermuda, uh, born and raised. I went to primary school at Padgett Primary and Work Academy uh, for high school, and that was during the public years. Uh, it wasn't private yet. Hi, Shanna. Um, 
I moved on from there to Acadia University, and that's in Nova Scotia in Canada, where I studied a Bachelor of Computer Science degree. Uh, in year one, I was introduced to the hobby of DJing uh, by a few gentlemen who were on their way out of university. Uh, they basically told me that you have a massive music collection, you have no choice, you're going to have to learn how to DJ. Um, so I started to set up events. Uh, we worked within student guidelines and um, figured out how we were going to hold these events and, and basically put things on. I quickly found out that there was an income to be made on a student budget. Anytime there's a little extra money coming in, is welcomed for sure. So after four years of university and doing events and creating a, a DJ career or a DJ uh, name for myself, um, I went on to join the workforce as an opportunity presented itself in Toronto. While in Toronto, I worked at Rogers Cable and IBM. Um, I worked in the IT field and gained ex a lot of experience and knowledge while working in Toronto. Um, I continued to DJ, but on a very small scale. I, wasn't, I had no plan to be a professional DJ. I had no plan to be in events. I had no plan to be doing what I'm doing today. As far as I was concerned, geeks were taking over the world. Computer science was where it's at. And I was well on my way with my knowledge and experience in computer science to being a successful adult. Once I moved back to Bermuda, I started working at the Barclay Institute. Um, the biggest thing that I learned at the Barclay Institute was, whenever you say Barclay Institute, the always goes in front of it. <laughs> uh, if you made a mistake and said Barclay, they quickly correct you and said, no, it's the Barclay. Thank you. Um, and that's one thing that I found is that they had massive pride in the alma mater. Uh, I found immediately that overseas experience helped. I was able to provide assistance without hands-on, and this built confidence. Um, while wa working at Rogers Cable and IBM, it was phone support. You were oftentimes talking to someone who wasn't even in the same zip code as what you were. But you had to listen to their problem, figure out what was going on, and give them steps to solve that problem. From Barclay, my next major role was at Bacardi Limited, uh, where I focused on a bunch of IT certs, because again, I was still a geek. Um, I was focused on Cisco, Microsoft, ITAL, which is a bit of IT uh, process uh, development, uh, VMware, which is virtualization, some project management, and I was got to the professional level in those curriculums. Also, while um, concurrently as all of that was going on, um, Soon after I returned to the island, I went to a party at a barbecue. Um, and at that barbecue, there were two gentlemen by the name of Daniel Reese and Paul Jenkins. And these guys had their CD collection, and they were just playing music. They had DJ equipment, and they had no clue what they were doing. None at all. I happened to have my CDs in the car, and I grabbed my CDs and said, hey, guys, take a break for five minutes. Um, let me, give me five minutes. Um, the party went very well, and everybody had a great time. And from that experience, uh, a company was born, and it was BMVJ Limited, which was known as Barmu Vindram. Uh, we partnered, and we produced many events throughout the island, and really pushed what we thought uh, was entertaining for us, which was Caribbean culture. Um, Daniel hails from St. Vincent and Barbados. Paul also hails from Barbados. So, and also in my coming back, I did notice that there wasn't much soca music being played at the time. Uh, Bermuda for entertainment was a lot of dancehall, a lot of reggae, some hip hop and rap thrown in, but soca was definitely at the small end of the scale, especially for my generation in return. Um, while I was in Toronto, I experienced many events, and they, and many soca based events, and they were very entertaining for me. I, I had a blast, I had a great time. So in coming back and meeting with two like minds, Daniel and Paul, and having that experience of not having soca music in Bermuda, it prompted us to push that forward and, and bring that to the forefront. So it was at that moment, meeting Daniel and Paul, that that was, became one of my goals. Uh, BMVJ also gave us our first experience with soca trucks. Um, some of you may remember back in 2011 was our first one. Um, it consisted of plywood, two by four, some hand pull generators that we had speakers plugged into them. We ran out of gas, the generator cut out. 
it taught us to think on our feet very quickly. Um, as we ran into these issues and ran into these problems, they needed to be solved, otherwise you're gonna get to the end of the parade with no song and no people. So um, it taught us very much so that we need, you need to be able to think on your feet, resolve problems as they happen, resolve them as they come. So this all uh, brewed into the entrepreneurial spirit and, and to where I am today. Uh, my years at Bacardi uh, ended with me being made redundant due to company structure changing. Um, at this time, the general, who was, was my DJ name and Passion Bermuda, which was is, uh, the Soka truck that we put in the Bermuda Day Parade, uh, they were growing into brands that were becoming more and more recognized locally. And the Bermuda, parade, Bermuda Day Parade at that point was never going to be the same again. I had no choice. It was always going to be in there. Um, so at this time of Crossroads is where I would say I entered the hallway, is what we're going to call it. And entrepreneurship just seemed like the right way to go. It seemed like the right move to make. Um, so confidence from previous IT work experience, being able to listen, understand problems, come up with solutions, think on my feet, uh, what I call hot seat solutions, uh, PR and marketing through BMVJ, what I call thinking outside the triangle. A lot of people say thinking outside the box, but in Bermuda, I call it thinking outside the triangle and thinking past where you are, thinking out to global markets and, and what can you sell not only to Bermuda, but what can make your product a, broad, a broader marketplace. Um, and with also much experience from working with Bacardi and the, like I said, the IT experience, taking in the IT knowledge was definitely uh, helpful in becoming in, in moving into entrepreneurship and uh, working with global markets and how to package a brand, set it up, have a professional look, um, how your brand could be one thing in Bermuda and another thing somewhere else definitely was something that I learned at Bacardi that I was able to take with me. And um, yeah, the entrepreneur was born. In former BHW Limited, we were incorporated in uh, September of 2014. Um, there were a lot of challenges in getting to what we have today in 2018 as Bermuda's fourth carnival. Um, most of the challenges were surrounded at first by people just didn't understand what I was talking about. When I said I wanted to have a carnival and I needed somebody to actually serve a drink from a truck, they looked at me like I was crazy. Um, they still look at me like I'm crazy. Um, so to explain concepts to people who haven't seen it for themselves and who don't understand it, the immediate response that we usually got back is, sorry, no, we can't do that. And what we're taught from young is you don't ask why. If you ask why in my mom's house, it wasn't going to end well. You just <laughs> did what she said, and that was it. So getting rid of that thinking and trying to think outside the triangle, as we call it, and asking why, why can't I serve a drink from a truck? Why do liquor licenses have to end at 2 a.m.? Why can't we start a liquor license at 3 a.m. and go to sleep at 8? Is anything wrong with it? Why not? Um, so in asking those questions, we found out most times there's no real good reason why. So why not do it this way? Um, so that was a lot of the challenges is having these conversations and moving past the shock and awe of uh, what are you trying to do? And moving on to solutions uh, definitely was our, our initial issues. So from there, once um, we got past why not, we needed to create believers in the program and believing that um, the plan that we had would work and believing that what we're trying to do makes sense. Um, so in creating believers, one of the believers that we had was Nelton Brangman. Nelton Brangman met me at one, a small event that I had at Docksiders. He had a great time at the event, and he talked to me afterwards. He said, well, why aren't we doing this on a larger scale? Why don't we have a carnival? And I explained to him my challenges, and Nelton immediately believed. Nelton thought that Bermuda had to have a carnival. He believed, even at that point, more than I did, that it was possible. Through the challenges that I had experienced, I was like, mm, I don't know. I don't think it's going to happen. I'm not sure. But Nelton believed, for sure. Uh, so I thank him every time we, we get into this position where uh, we're being positive and we're being successful and things are going well, because without Nalton, I don't know if we would be here in 2018. Um, so we moved on. We decided to form a company as, again, 
we were incorporated in 2014 and we created email addresses, websites, bought domain names and started the movement rolling. And we had our first carnival in 20, June of 2015. It was also mentioned in Erica's uh, presentation that uh, forming a team is imperative. Um, having people beside you to help you through the process is definitely a key part of the entrepreneurial uh, journey. So I selected directors and I looked around in my circles at people who were, they followed along with what I wanted to BHW to represent, professionalism. I wanted BHW to have a professional look. So when we walk into a room, uh, people are, they look at us in a positive light. We're not going to, we don't dress in jeans and baggy t-shirts. We're looking professional, looking smart. And I looked around in my circles and I said, well, who exemplifies that? Who can I put on my team that will help me through the process, but also believed in what I want to do? Um, so we formed that team. We had five directors in 2014. Uh, Jermaine Davis, Sandra Richards-Vance, uh, Nelton Brangman, and Akbar Lightborn, and myself. And the team, we started to work things out. We had weekly meetings. And we started to go through the challenges that we were having and worked with the stakeholders to see how we can overcome those challenges. The next step, we, we went on to meet with the BTA. Um, they had presented or put together what was called the National Tourism Plan. Um, in the National Tourism Plan, it outlaid what, they, what their plans were for tourism for Bermuda for the next few years. Um, we basically modeled our product and what we were, wanted to achieve after the, the National Tourism Plan. We knew that that was the way to be accepted. So in creating those believers at the BTA, it was a lot easier. They, it was difficult for them to say no because my plan was pretty much lined up with yours. So in being an entrepreneur, once you know what your product is, I find that aligning it to what the market wants and what the market needs is also a key step. So once we were approved by the BTA, we set out to be the best partner they ever had. Uh, we wanted to deliver on everything that we promised we said we were going to do, um, exceed expectations, and basically go the extra mile wherever that came about because we wanted to be a long-lasting partner with the BTA and something that wasn't a one-year hit. Once we had the believers, what we needed to do is create the audience. Um, in creating the audience and during my years of enjoying carnivals, I managed to travel to a lot of different countries and cities. Places like Toronto, New York, Cayman Islands, uh, Bahamas, Trinidad, Barbados, through the U.S. and D.C., uh, even as far out as Los Angeles and London. And a lot of these places, they have their own carnivals. So while I was there was also doing research, finding out what do they do in their countries that can be useful in Bermuda, what mistakes did they make so that we don't make the same ones, um, what things do people like about their carnivals so that we can kind of emulate that, make it put a Bermudian twist on it, make it our own, but find out what works and what doesn't. So market research is definitely a key, a part of, of once you have your product, the steps in order to move it forward. Once we um, gained that audience, through the research, we went back to those jurisdictions um, Key contacts were made. Once we said that we were looking to have a carnival in Bermuda, people were immediately interested. They were, when is this carnival? When is it going to happen? Can I come? Can I bring my friends? This is the type of things that we wanted to hear. So we went back to those folks with our product, um, with our website, with our marketing and advertising and said, well, can you market us in your jurisdictions? Um, the response came back very positive. I found that um, Bermuda is a desirable destination. People don't know how or why they want to get here. They just do which was great for us. Um, so we used that and leveraged that uh, to our advantage and worked with those partners and worked with those people to market and gain that audience and that interest from year one. Um, and we found that that was definitely beneficial. We also experienced some legal challenges. One of the um, ones I already mentioned was, like I said, the liquor license challenge. Um, I'll tell you a story. My, I was 16, 17, I had a bike. My mom. We, I had a curfew. I had to be home by a certain hour. Mom said, be home by, let's say, 11 o'clock. I went out one night. I was having a good time. Things were going well. Everything was fine. I was enjoying myself. And I stayed out past my curfew. And um, I knew it was past curfew. I knew what time it was. I'm just going to go home later than that. So when I did get home, 
And my mom asked me, well, what happened? Like, why were you late? I was like, well, I knew I was late. I knew I was going to be late, but I figured I'll just face the music when I got home. So that conversation, we call it the face the music conversation. And as entrepreneurs, I find sometimes um, you don't always want to ask for permission, ask for forgiveness. Um, if you know what your idea is, you think your idea can work, find a way that it works within the existing laws. Find a way that it works within the existing rules, make it happen, and then afterwards go have the conversation with the people who you probably should have had the conversation with first if you were asking permission, and then let's have a conversation then. That's what we did with Juve. Uh, Juve, we held it out at Dockyard in the first year. There was no law to enable us to do what we wanted to do, but we still wanted to do it. But what we did is didn't break the law. We didn't advertise that we were selling alcohol and we didn't sell alcohol. We found ways in which we could make Juve work without having a liquor license. Um, so we didn't ask for permission to have it. We did it and we asked for forgiveness afterwards. It worked out. <laughs> so <laughs> as a result, um, in 2016, we were able to basically in those conversations after 2015, they saw the success, they saw that it worked. Um, they were receptive to our ideas, they were receptive to making amendments to the existing liquor license law to allow us to be able to do what we want to do. As a result, in the Liquor License Act now, we have the tourism event license. And in a tourism event license, it allows the magistrate to be able to basically allow special permits, special licenses to events that would normally be outside of the regular liquor license, or what's called an occasional liquor license. So entrepreneurs, sometimes you gotta take that risk. Sometimes, like I said, you don't ask for permission, ask for forgiveness. Don't break any laws, don't upset people too much, but uh, sometimes you just uh, gotta take that leap of faith and go for it. Where are we? Also, we, um, in 2015, another challenge that we had uh, was out at Morgan's Point. The first carnival was due to happen in Morgan's Point. Um, they had construction challenges, there were asbestos removal, all kinds of things that were happening out at Morgan's Point that didn't allow us to be in Morgan's Point. The challenge for us was they told us that we could use it, and then 10 days before carnival told us that we couldn't. So in months and months and months of planning our first carnival, um, that was definitely another massive challenge, was moving four events from one location to four other locations in 10 days. Um, the team rose to the challenge. We didn't sleep. Uh, we made ma many, many, many phone calls, emails, face-to-face uh, -face meetings and conversations, and we were able to, with the stakeholders, work it all out and get it done. 2015 ran off with success, and because of the success, we were able to have the conversations around 2016 and have some more solid, uh, some more solid venues and move forward with 2016. Uh, economic impact is something that we wanted to show early. In our projections, we basically set out three-year to five-year projections on how many visitors did we anticipate coming to the island. Um, visitor spend was key for BHW. Um, local spend is great. You guys' money is already on the island, though. What people are excited about and people who stakeholders are excited about is new money coming into the island. So how many visitors can we get to the island? How much are they gonna spend while they're here? And what does it mean for economic impact? Um, in year one in 2015, our target was 150 visitors. We reached 172. The spend was roughly about between 25 and 3,000 visitors. Uh, and in 2016, we grew over 300% to having 560 visitors. Um, this was a big number for us and we were very excited about it. Clearly what we done in BHW 2015, there were a few people who traveled, tried it out and said, it's a new carnival, let me see what happens. They went back and told their friends. And they had such a great time in 2015 that the numbers tripled. And we had a very successful 2016. 2017, um, with America's Cup and its challenges with accommodations, uh, resources, and the availability of the pieces that we need to make things work, we were still able to grow to 736 visitors. 736 visitors multiplied by their roughly $3,000 spend because that went up in 2017. Uh, we were looking at about $2.5 million injection into the economy. Uh, so. 
Thank you. So the um, economic impact was something that we wanted to set out early and wanted to basically justify the reason why we wanted to have a carnival in Bermuda. Um, so that's the one thing that we had to do as entrepreneurs and starting out was why, why do your believers believe in you? Um, why should we have your product in existence? Um, do the research, do the math, figure it out so that people can't tell you no. People can't tell you that it's not justified or it doesn't make sense. Where are we now? 2018 and its impact. Uh, BHW 2018 is this year from June 15th to 18th. Uh, we are now officially the world's fastest growing carnival. Um, other carnivals take years to achieve the number of visitors, the level of talent, and the amount spent that we've managed to achieve in just three years. In 2018, uh, we're targeting, we want to reach over 1,000 visitors. Um, in Bermuda, I don't know if there's anyone from the tourism industry here, I believe the amount of beds in Bermuda is at about 2,500, 2,500 spaces for people to sleep. Um, so if we want to occupy half of those, um, we're growing at a, at, a, at a great rate. And again, I'll touch on the economic impact again. It's, it touches so much in terms of the island and, and the impact to the island. Um, we mentioned the spend, but what I'll do here is go into a little bit more of a detail on who that impacts. As the entrepreneur, it was great for us to set up a business. I love being an entrepreneur. I love working for myself. But then also being able to touch other businesses and to affect their businesses and their bottom lines was also high ranking in terms of what we wanted to achieve. Um, there's a lot of vendors that were involved, such as food vendors. Uh, I talked to Ms. Simmons at Ouija, Ouija uh, Fabrics. She's up in the arcade on Reed Street. She managed to open up a secondary store during Carnival, and she imported beads, feathers, pieces that you'll need to have your costume. This is something that she might not have done, we don't know, but she might not have been able to do without Carnival. She saw the need, she was able to expand her business because BHW exists. Um, the bands, we have five bands in existence that will go down the road on, uh, in 2018 in June. And they're young Bermudians. They have trader IDs with customs. They import things. They're collecting, government is collecting their duty each time they ship something in. They're selling in the marketplace today costumes that can range anywhere from $300 on upwards past $1,000. Uh, so commerce is happening, money is being exchanged, and it's touching young Bermudian business. Clearing stores now purchased for BHW. There's themed parties such as White Parties, um, Urban Cottage, and Nicole. They bring in specifically white attire for White Parties, and she sells out for the second, third year in a row. Um, children's Sitting Services, this is a new one that came up this year. A business was formed so that if you want to go to Carnival, they'll watch your kids. Great plan. I was like, whoa. <laughs> awesome plan. So it... it so people who want to participate in Carnival and you don't have anywhere to put your kids, these guys will take your money and your kids <laughs> and you can go to Carnival. <laughs> Transportation services is an obvious one. Taxis, minibuses, we need to move these people around. And in fact, transportation was one of the, and continues to still be, one of the biggest challenges we have. Uh, we have a ton of people that want to move and get to events and taxi services don't always want to work past six, seven o'clock. So um, finding a taxi at the hours of night that we wish to travel isn't always easy. Um, females, ladies in particular, they want to bedazzle everything. Boots, shoes, headpieces, hats, armbands, everything. Um, I've seen online many in a few different areas where people are able to take your existing shoe, bedazzle your shoe, and give it back to you. A couple of dollars, they're making some money, but they've able to start a really small business out of what we would call not much. Makeup, the makeup um, artists are very busy during carnival. They get the ladies ready to go on the road on Monday and they have appointments and bookings from 5 a.m. in the morning right up until start time at 10 o'clock and they're busy. One of the biggest impacts that we see and it's a very positive one is fitness and health. Um, all of these gyms have carnival programs. All of the personal trainers are busy with getting people ready for June. It's not only business for them, but it's healthy lifestyle. 
it's, it's, it's basically helping people to eventually live longer. It's healthy, positive living. Um, the entertainment, entertainment industry as a whole we've seen elevate. Um, where, like I said, when I first came back to the island 14 years ago, we didn't have soca DJs, much less soca artists. Um, but this weekend on Saturday, there's a pretty cool event happening in Dockyard on Saturday night from 9 p.m. till 3 a.m. If you want to come out, let me know. Um, <laughs> and we have international soca artists performing from Trinidad. We have international soca DJs. So the entertainment industry and the entertainment that is being provided is now elevated. Bermuda is also on a world stage in a market that we didn't necessarily touch before. As I mentioned, I ran across a lot of people in my travels, and they were basically asking the question, well, when's Bermuda's carnival? When should I come to Bermuda? I want to come to Bermuda. I'm interested. I've heard of it, but I don't know when to come. My answer was cup match. Some people will come for, for cup match, but then when they ask, what's cup match? And I was like, well, it's Emancipation Day, and we play cricket for two days. Um, it's a great time. We're on the beach. There's water. There's activity but it's not carnival. For carnival chasers and carnival followers, if it's not carnival, they're not really coming. So now we have that answer to the carnival enthusiast, someone who's a carnival chaser, that here's our carnival, here's when you come to Bermuda. Um, so it's, uh, Bermuda's won that map, Bermuda's won that focus. We're in that list of places do you, you go. There's Trinidad Carnival in February, there's Jamaica Carnival that's happening next weekend, and then there's Bermuda in June. We automatically get said in that lineup of, of, of carnivals. And there are many carnivals that aren't in that lineup. One thing that uh, we also wanted to push in the economic impact is that what we find in other jurisdictions and in the research that I did was that when carnivals start up, when big entities and big names um, see that there's potential success in that jurisdiction, they typically take a big brand and drop it into that country and walk away with all that country's money. So we didn't want that to happen in Bermuda, and we took the 60-40 rule as uh, something that we wanted to take on for BHW Limited when it came to international partnerships. There are big, big brands and carnivals. You might recognize the name Marshall Montano, Tribe. These very big names typically would go into a smaller carnival, such as Barbados. We'll use them as an example. And they would set up their events. And because the international visitor and even the local visitor or the local patron is familiar with that brand, they'll go to those events, they'll go to those parties, they'll sign up with that person. But that money wouldn't stay in Bermuda. That money would then leave with the international folks when they, when they go. So what we focused on on BHW is local Bermudian business. We told the Bermudian promoters and, and anyone who wanted to be involved in BHW that we're pushing you as the event to go to. We're pushing you as this is who you want to sign up with. When we got a lot of requests from the international folks to set up their events, and they email and they call every year, we told them, no, sorry, the only way that you can have an event in Bermuda is if you partner with a local Bermudian partner and there needs to be a 60-40 partnership. We couldn't. <laughs> it was very difficult to enforce that um, because at the end of the day, an international partner can pick up the phone, call up a boat charter company, book a boat, and have their event. It's difficult for us to, to monitor that and make sure that that happens. But in the marketplace, uh, for us to be able to market their event, um, that was one of the criteria. We've also informed venues and the boat operators and any, venue, or any uh, venue that we can think of where a party may happen uh, that this may come to you. You may get a phone call from someone who's going to say, hey, I want to do an event during Heroes Weekend. Can I set up my event? And we ask them to just simply ask questions, find out who they are, find out where they're from find out who, where the business is based, if the actual business is registered. If they're not registered in Bermuda, we don't suggest you take it. Um, they're coming to Bermuda to take our money and run. So let's not let that happen. <clears throat> What's next for BHW Limited? Um, I just had a conversation, and BHW Limited is right now, it happens in June. That's where the bulk of our money is made. Um, that's where the bulk of our marketing is focused. We go overseas. We have international events in Toronto, New York City, uh, Miami, and we try to draw people to come to Bermuda during June. Um, what the, what's next for BHW Limited is to become a year-round, an annual, a non-stop revenue generator. We need to find other revenue streams. We need to find other ways to make money throughout the rest of the year, not just June. Um, so there's a couple of different ways in... in, in 
how I envision we're going to be able to do that. Um, but that's where we're moving forward, and that's how uh, we plan to move the company forward. So let's go. Uh, we're in an entrepreneurial entrepreneur summit, um, so we're going to touch back on that. And my again, my personal experience. Um, once I got a real taste for entrepreneurship, I knew it was right for me. Like it, it just made sense. Facing the music, accepting the challenges, listening to people's problems, taking on solutions, um, it just fit my lifestyle and what I want to do. Um, I enjoy it. Like I said, I'll never go back. And it's something that I'm grateful that it happened to me um, in the sense that I'm, yes, redundancy is not always the best thing. It wasn't planned. It was something that you had to work out financially. But I'm very happy that it happened and it pushed me to be the entrepreneur I am today. What, you, what we do as entrepreneurs is create the job that we want. Uh, early on in life, uh, we're taught, usually taught a mindset that time equals money. I had jobs that required me to be at a desk for 40 plus hours in a week in order to receive a wage. As a DJ, I needed to show up and perform for many hours uh, at an event in order to be paid the amount I was requesting. As an entrepreneur, I started to think of ways that I could make money without being there. Try to think of ways that I essentially make money in my sleep. There's no reason for me to show up at a venue for me to make money. So strategic overseas partnerships, for instance, with people who are having events in New York, I don't necessarily have to be in New York for that partnership to make money. So the thinking and the mindset as an entrepreneur, uh, it shifted. And, and that's really what I enjoy the most. Um, I recently posted a little uh, image on Instagram and entrepreneurs, uh, my job, it's nonstop. I, I was, it was Sunday night and people were dreading Monday showing up at their desk. And I really don't feel like there's a Monday. It never ends for me. It's continuous, it's always, if the phone rings at seven o'clock at night or seven o'clock in the morning and it's business, it's business, it gets handled. Whether it's Sunday, Tuesday, Saturday, it's business, it still happens. So the job that, that I've managed to create for myself, it doesn't stop. There is no Monday. Um, I, and again, I enjoy it. I love it. Travel, um, the events, meeting new people, different audiences um, in each market, global market, and experiencing other people's cultures and how people do things overseas and versus what we do in Bermuda and then being able to relate that to Bermuda and put it in Bermuda with our own little twist. Um, yeah, all things that I enjoyed and all the job that I've managed to create for myself. Be a subject matter expert. Uh, in IT, we have courses and, and exams. Uh, we learn someone else's product and you become a subject matter expert. Essentially, what they're teaching you to do is be an expert in the result of someone else's entrepreneurship. Someone else came up with that idea, they developed the product, and now they're training you to become an expert in that. When I thought about that, I was like, I want to be the expert in what I want to do. I want to be the expert in, in, in my field, in my industry, in my product. Um, no one can tell you about your product. If it's your product, if it's your idea, you're the automatically the expert. Be the expert. And in learning from one thing that I learned quickly with uh, Streetwise MBA, hi, Coral. Um, I recently did Streetwise MBA, and one thing that I quickly learned was uh, have a sales pitch. And one thing that um, lacked in my sales pitch was my own self-pride and, and being proud of what I accomplished. Um, it's something that I struggle with all the time. And learning that from Streetwise MBA was an awesome experience, and I can proudly say my name is Jason Sukdeo. I'm the president of BHW Limited, and we produce the world's fastest growing carnival. Yeah, it's, um, that was, <laughs> so when you get that reaction from the first sentence of your sales pitch, you got them, like, you're so, it's good. <laughs> yeah, so um, being a subject matter ex expert and being proud of what you do, being proud of your product is key. And people can tell right away when you have conversations with people and um, you talk to people about what you do, um, when you're proud of it, it, it shows. So be like the Barclays.
um, put the in front of your name and uh, be proud of what you do. <laughs> Finally, um, we have meetings. We talk a lot about great things. We come to conferences. We take courses. We sit down and listen to others. Others talk about how they did it. We jot down notes. And that's all great. I think it's all helpful in the experience, and it's helpful in the learning process in terms of doing what you want to get done. Um, but actually getting it done is what needs to happen. I think Erica mentioned that in her presentation as well, is that you can make all the plans you want, but until you actually sit down put pen to paper, put fingers to keyboards, actually get it done, then you're becoming an entrepreneur. So um, I'm definitely not an expert. We're going to let this video run while I finish up. This is Bermuda Heroes Weekend, our recap video, one of the videos that we're using to promote BHW 2018. Um, if you asked me 15 years ago what I wanted to be, it definitely wouldn't have been standing up here. I was, like I said, geeks were taking over the world, and IT was going to rule everything, and that was my path. But I'm happily in front of you today as an entrepreneur, and it was the best step that I've, that I've made. I want to thank the Bermuda Leeds team for the invitation, Jennifer Card, Kelly Reeves, Vaughn Mosier, Helen Orchard, and Benedict's Associates. And I want to thank you all for listening. I wish you nothing but the best in your endeavors, and I hope me sharing my BHW story has helped someone achieve their goals and objectives. Thank you.